We're reading this week in Parshas Kisetze. The simple reading of the portion speaks about going out to war against your enemy. And when you're in battle, you see a woman who you're attracted to. And the Torah allows, according to most commentators, that if you see this woman, although she's not Jewish, as long as you have in mind to bring her back, to convert and take her as a wife, you're permitted even to cohabit with her out in the battlefield. And therefore, as a result of this, the whole story with David, and there was a story between Amnon and Tomar, which is mentioned in Pirkei Ovos. What is Ava Hatluya Bedover? Love, which is contingent on something. The example which is given is the love between Amnon and Tamar. Amnon and Tamar were both the children of David. And he wanted to marry her. And they were in love. And Tamar says to her father, says to her brother, if her father permits it, it's not a problem. You have to ask permission. Whatever it is, he feigned that he was not well. She took care of him. He raped her and it was disastrous, the result of whatever happened. So the, based on the majority of the commentators discussed this, I mean, it was incest, his brother and sister. How did they even consider getting married? The answer is that David had gone to war and he had seen a, a, woman, a woman, a princess, and he desired her and he cohabited with her in war. So she, Am, Tom, Amnon was conceived before the mother was converted. And then afterwards, he brought her back, she converted. So since she was conceived not as a Jew, so when she was born, David halachically was not the father, was not the father. So although they were biologically related, but halachically they were not related whatsoever. This is the background. So the Torah allows, as long as you have a mind to take the woman back and marry her, convert and marry her, the Torah permits this. That's, that's the simple reading of the portion. The Rechaim HaKadosh speaks at length, why does the Torah permit this? I mean, this is playing right into the hands of the, in, the evil inclination to permit this. So he has a whole lengthy understanding based on the Zohar that because if you see the woman, even if she's ugly and not desirable in the physical sense, but for some reason there's an attraction that's an indication that she possesses a special soul. Whole thing with how at the time when Adam made with the tree of knowledge, how Satan had taken special souls captive. And the only way they could be released is this manner, that's what a Torah permits it. But he explains it on an illusionary level. What is the greatest battle, the greatest challenge of every, especially a Jew's life? Contending with life. Every moment is a challenge. Every moment is a choice. The temptations of life, without the environment, just naturally the physicality of a human being, the chemistry of a human being, we're inclined to everything which is contrary to spirituality. That's the fact of a human being. So in Hebrew, gram grammatically speaking, it doesn't say kisetze lim l'chama, you're going to war. You're going la l'chama. This is the war of wars. You're entering into a battle. There's no battle which is the equivalent of this battle. That's the battle of the evil inclination. It's something we have to fight and contend with 24 hours a day, every moment of our existence. It's continuous. Now the question is, how do you deal with this battle? You know, the Chavetz Chaim writes in one location that when you go to battle with an enemy, you beat him long enough the enemy gives up because he figures what's the point. He may, over time, he may regroup and believe he could come back. But the evil inclination is an enemy that 24 hours, seven days a week, every moment of your life, if you push him away on one side, he comes back in a different guise. There's no let up every moment of your life, you're hounded. We find in the Torah that we know that the greatest Jews who ever lived other than Moshe Rabbeinu, the founding fathers of Klal Yisrael, the Jewish people, are the Avos HaGadoshim, the Holy Patriarchs, Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov, 
Avram introduced God to existence. Avram was able to succeed and withstand the 10 tests, even bringing his son, who was beloved to him at the age of 37, to bring him as a, as a sacrifice. God will not associate, did not associate his name with Avram to say, okay, Avram, until he passed on. Why? Because till the last moment of a person's life, God says, you never know. A person could change at the last moment, God forbid, and become a heretic, become a denier. Same thing with Yaakov. Yaakov is the Bechir Shebaovos. He's the most special of the patriarchs. He fathered the 12 tribes. God would not associate his name with Yaakov until Yaakov passed on. Only Yitzchok, because Yitzchok was blind and he was confined to the house, in his lifetime, God presented himself as Elkei Yitzchok. But any other person, so what kind of battle? If the Ovas HaKadoshim, even they, the only patriarchs with the world stands in the merit. We're still drawing on the merit. We still say, Zochech has the Yovos. Whenever we pray, we're still, still drawing on the merit. Even them, they weren't guaranteed as long as they were alive that they would maintain and retain that status. So what kind of battle are we entering into? It's a battle which is almost untenable battle. So you know something? Might as well give up. The answer is, as it says, that if a person takes the initiative and you want to be steadfast, you will merit divine assistance. God will allow you to, to win the battle. But you're only winning single battles, skirmishes. Every day, every moment, it's another challenge. But you have to know in advance that if you're sufficiently committed and you're cognizant of the seriousness of the moment, God will assist you and he will give you into, his, into your hands. You'll be victorious continuously. Otherwise, it's a losing battle. If you read anything about a person who's, uh, who's taken foreign substances, drug addict, because he has this foreign substance in his system, in his body, the moment he starts craving, it's something, regardless of how brilliant he is, how much he understands the nature of the illness, he has no control, loses control. The level of conflict, of need, becomes so overwhelming, he becomes totally irrational at that moment. Even, God forbid, to commit a crime, even to kill for it. That's how overwhelming, all-consuming this craving is. The evil inclination is so intertwined in our essence, because the essence of a being, of a human being, is his physicality. The inclination is so overwhelming, all-consuming. Could you stand up against a tidal wave? Could you stand up against a tsunami? It's impossible. A typhoon, it's not possible. This is what we're talking about. We have to know, God will assist you. You just have to take the initiative, as it says regarding Elul. You have to just take the initiative. Ani Lododi Vidodi League, which is the acronym for Elul. I am to my beloved when my beloved is to me. God says, you just have to take the initiative. Slight initiative. You take the initiative no larger than a pinprick, the point of a needle. I will open a vistas, which are the equivalent of an anteroom, a banquet hall. That's what Hashem will, that's the degree of assistance that we need. So if a person knows that, then the person pretty much is secure and we know exactly what to do. You know, you have, you have enemies and you have the uh, atomic bomb. It's irrelevant how many people they, they are. If they don't have that, atomic weapon and you have it you know you're short and you have to and you know you can use it we have more than the atomic weapon we have Hashem says I'm with you there's nothing that's beyond my ability I will incapacitate him I will dispel him and I will allow you to take control of your life we read in Pirkei Ovos we just read in last week's the sixth chapter it says when Hashem gave us the tablets the luchos it says chorus chorus ala luchos Chorus, that the Ten Commandments were etched, were engraved on the tablets. So the Mishnah tells us, Al tikri chorus el chorus. The letters of chorus and chorus are the same letters. Chorus means free. Just change the vowels. The vowels. 
Who's the free man? The one who engages in Torah study. And this is based on the principle which God says, I've created the inclination. He may be all-consuming, but I've, I've given you an antidote. The antidote is the Torah itself. That is the antidote which incapacitates and lets, allows you to take control of your life and to be in full control. If you have that, you have nothing to be concerned. Then you, you're a ben You're truly a free man. You're not subject to your desires, to your inclinations, to all your inhibitions. You take control of your life. You know, it's interesting. You have all kinds of positions written on um, predetermined personalities or whatever they are, people locked into certain behavior patterns. Why they locked in? A person, legally, halachically, a person's unstable, he's unstable. A person's unstable, he's not held culpable, he's, he's classified as an incompetent person. That's because he's mentally unstable. But a person who's stable, you could say, but you're still locked in. A person has certain inclinations, desires. Rambam speaks about that. Extreme level of desire, whatever it may be. A person says, I can't help it. Is this such a thing? Is this such a thing? So it's interesting. A non-Jew, it's interesting. It's cited in the Medrash Chazal. The Gemara tells us that when we said Nasev and Nishma at Sinai and we were taken as God's people, the Jews themselves reverted back to pre-sin of Adam. Pre-sin. When we failed with the golden calf, we reverted back to posin. Now, when Adam ate, when Odom Rishon ate of the tree of knowledge, the fruity tree of knowledge, the Gemara tells us in regard to Chava, who's the mother of all mankind, Bon nochosh v'itl bozuama. The serpent, the ancient snake, which personified evil in the most vile, intense, potent context, he actually, he, he had relations with her, sexual relations. And he infused within her a spiritual pollution, which is all-consuming. When we came to Sinai, exposed to that degree of Hashem's presence, that impurity was vaporized. There were two impurities. There's the impurity of the Eitz the tree of knowledge, and there was the impurity of the serpent. The impurity of the serpent was vaporized. And the Gemara says, even after we reverted back, when we did the, the golden calf, we reverted back to Posen, we did not revert back to the state where we were still polluted with the impurity of the snake. That was, that was removed from us. That was expunged from us. We no, no longer had relevance to that any longer. As a result of that, we're able to be in a position in a context of choice that within the context of Tairag Mitzvahs, the 248 Mitzvahs I say, positive commandments, and 360 negative commandments, we're in a position to make choices. The non-Jew, he still has that impurity. And because he has that impurity, all that God wants from him is just maintain the seven Noahide laws. Nothing more. He has no relevance he cannot survive within the context of Tarek Mitzvos because the level of clarity and uh, stability, spiritual stability you need, you ha they don't have that because they still have that zuomo, they have that spiritual impurity, pollution within them. That's the reason. So you have all these great thinkers and philosophers and sociologists, they write about classifying segments and conditions psychiatric, psychological conditions, they have no understanding what it is. Because the vast majority of the world are not Jews. And because they're not Jews, therefore, they have, they have no control in many areas of their life. And the areas of their life that they have no control, they're not held culpable. But the seven high laws just live as a civilized human being. Don't commit adultery. Don't commit incest. Don't murder. Don't eat a, a limb of a a living animal, or flesh of a living animal. Don't blaspheme God. That they have relevance to. That they're able to contend with. But the finer points, which are the 
other mitzvahs which we have, which the Jews have, which were given at Sinai, that they have no relevance to. So the Jew has to contend, but we were given the ability to activate systems that were able to confront the greatest enemy, to go out to the La Milchama. This is the greatest battle that, that was ever fought. It's the battle of life. God will give him into your hand. Now it's interesting. The Gemara tells us that, that if a person sees that problems are cropping up on him, physical problems, other problems, physical ailments, it says, a person has to introspect, has to do an internal examination to see where, where did he fail. That's what he has to do. And he has to correct those failings. And hopefully if he corrects them, things will get better. All the suffering and all the setbacks and reversals will stop. So the Gemara says, what happens? Pishpesh velomotza. He went, he did the introspection. He found out, he did the internal audit. His record is perfect. Yitla bebitl Torah. He should attribute it to bitl Torah. To, he didn't study sufficiently. So the Vilna Gon asks a question. We're saying he did the, the internal audit, he introspected, and he couldn't find a reason why he should be suffering to this degree. He should attribute a Bittal Torah. I mean, evidently when he did the internal audit, he did the introspection, he checked to see if, was, if he failed in Torah. So if that's the case, so just as if we attributed it to Torah, and he didn't pick it up the first time, maybe we should attribute it to something else, and he also didn't pick it up the first time. Why should he attribute the Torah? He could attribute it to many other things. As the first time he didn't realize it was the Torah, not studying sufficiently, maybe he didn't do another mitzvah perfectly enough. And that's the reason why he's suffering. That's the question which is asked by the Vilna Gon. So my Rosh Hashiva Zech Tzarek used to say, always to answer this question, he would say, Torah is very interesting. Now, what's considered Bittal Torah? A person has to earn a living. He has to support a family. You have to sleep. You have to eat. There are many things you have to do. You can't be involved 24 hours a day continuously throughout your life. So there are times that you're permitted not to study. The time that you're permitted to take out. But let's say you took out more time than you should have. That's Bittal Torah. But let's say there's certain days that you're permitted to take out more time because that day it's permitted. You need another hour of sleep and you truly need it. Now you're fully rested. The next day you don't need that hour. You say, well, every day I take that extra hour. No. The day that it's not needed, it's not justified. So therefore, because it's so unclear what is and what's not, therefore, initially when he did the audit, eating non-kosher is eating non-kosher. Not observing Shabbos is not observing Shabbos. Whatever else, it's either A or B. It's right or wrong. But here, this, it, it depends on the, on, on, on the context of the situation. Therefore, because it's unclear, initially you justified it, that you were permitted, but now that it continues to persist, we say, you know something, your justification, your evaluation wasn't, wasn't accurate, therefore attribute it to Bittal Torah. That's what my Rosh Hashiva, Zechayim Vrocha, would always say. However, Chaim Volozhna in the Nefesh Chaim writes this, He says that we find that the, the Ramach Mitzvah the 240 positive commandments, as we just said, and they correspond to 248 parts of the body. The 365 negative commandments, which correspond to the sinews of the body. If you fail in any one of them, there's a direct correlation, a consequence, to the hand, to the heart, to every part of the body. So now the question is, why is the heart ailing? Why do you have the pain in the hand? So evidently, maybe you should have given stoker. it says, Pasoach Tiftach. When the poor man comes, extend your hand. You should not withdraw your hand. So the withdrawal of the hand is a negative commandment. Not extending hand is, a, is not performing a positive commandment. There's a consequence. So if you have pain, they'll see checked. It's not, 
It's, I did charity properly, okay? So why do you have a pain in your hand? The heart, you had envy in your heart, right? You lost it in your heart, whatever it is, okay? You checked it, it's okay. But Torah itself, where it emanates from, it emanates from the highest echelons of spirituality, which goes beyond anything that has to do with the human body. So there's no corresponding factor. It's the totality of existence. God created existence with Torah itself. Therefore, if you can't, somehow, you don't see the correlation between the mitzvah and, and, the, and the consequence, you should attribute it to Torah. Because Torah itself, is, there's no corresponding factor. It's the totality of all existence. That's how Rav Chaim Volozhin explains it. So if it's the totality of all existence, now why does the evil inclination exist? It's a creation. It says that after God created existences, God saw all that he created was tov ma'od. All he created was very good. So the Medjur says, what, what is tov ma'od? Tov ma'od is Yitzhara. It's the evil inclination. Why is that tov ma'od? If a person would not have be challenged, and naturally he would do good, why are you deserving of any, any, any reward? It's only because you have a challenge and it's only due to your suppression of your inclination you did the right thing. So the right, the good deed is attributed to the person. And if a person fails where he had the ability to rein in and he did not, so why did he fail? He, because he chose not to rein in. So therefore, the basis for existence of value, what gives value to existence is the evil inclination. Therefore, it's tov ma'od. That's the medrash. Tov ma'od. But as much as he's tov ma'od, but you still have to have the, the weaponry, the, with, the wherewithal to deal with that tov ma'od. This is la milchoma. God will give him in your hand. He gives you the weaponry. Whether it's hakol kol Yaakov. The kol kol Yaakov is Torah. It's the mitzvahs. It's tefillah, whatever it is. We pray for divine assistance. We can't take anything for granted. That's what it is. There's a morale. The morale of Prague writes, and Pirkei says something beautiful. We find that right before the, um, at the time of the great flood, when Hashem destroyed the world, the Torah says, God said, Yetzel lev odom min urov. The inclination of man is evil, min urov literally means from his youth. So Rashi cites the Gemara, that the Gemara says, when is man already subject to evil? Mishininar meme imo. When he's cast from the womb of his mother. From the moment the child is born, from that moment onward, the child, the infant, is, is, is born one moment that child is already subject to the influence of the evil inclination. It's a statement, Rabbi Yochan makes the statement. When when he's cast from the womb of his mother, the evil inclination starts its effect. So the morale of Prague says, why not before it's cast from its mother's stomach? What about in utero? The child is not subject to the evil inclination. Why? What's the reason? Because God says only when the child is complete, only then does the evil inclination have a right, is given permission to influence. When the child is in utero, is, in, is just gestating, is developing, God says the evil inclination has no permission to what? To influence that child in utero. So he says a f- profound understanding. He says if a person is born and now you're an adult and you live your life like you're not a finished person. For instance, every moment of your life you invest in Avodah Hashem and serving God. And there's never a moment you could rest on your laurels and you said, I've done enough for today. You never ever reach that moment. So if that's the case, you're always, it's progress in motion. You're always undeveloped. You're living your life. You're not finished. You're not a finished person. The only time the evil inclination has a right to affect you, you say, I think I've done enough today. I'm complete. The moment you have a sense you're complete, even for the moment, you're susceptible. But if you live your life that you never feel complete, 
and you invest it fully, and the only reason why at this moment you're stopping is because you can't go further, then the evil inclination cannot, cannot affect you whatsoever. This is the morale of Prague in Pirkei Ovos. So it's interesting. The Briska Rov has a, an inference from a Rambam in the laws of Talmud Torah. The law is normally, we say, osig mitzvah potum in a mitzvah. If a person is engaged in one mitzvah, you're exempt from another mitzvah. However, the only exception is the study of Torah. A person studying and a poor man comes and the only one who could attend to that poor man's needs is this person who's learning. You're obligated to interrupt your Torah study to help that poor man. You have to interrupt your Torah study to take the lulav. Because since the lulav cannot be delegated to a third party, you're obligated to interrupt your, interrupt your Torah study for, to take the lulav. And the same thing is true with any mitzvah, which is not the case with other mitzvahs. You're in the middle of taking your lulav, a poor man comes to you and asks you for charity. Because you're engaged in the mitzvah of the lulav, you don't interrupt the taking of the four species to give the poor man the charity. But when it comes to Torah, you're obligated to interrupt if it cannot be delegated through a third party. That's, that's the law. It's based on psukim, on verses. But the Rambam says that when you interrupt to do whatever that mitzvah may be, you interrupt with in mind that you're coming back to study. Those are the Rambam's words. Rambam should say that you're permitted to interrupt because it can't be delegated, and that's the story. That's the end of the, the statement. No. And when you interrupt, you should have a mind, you're coming back to continue. Once you finish addressing whatever that, that, that obligation may be at the moment. What does, he say, what does the Ram have to say? You must have a mind to come back. The answer is, with the morale of Prague, it's very good. What's the tavlin? What is the antidote to the evil inclination, Torah? So if a person always feels he's never finished, I'm only interrupting because I have no choice. I'm coming back. <clears throat> I'm only going to sleep because I don't have an ounce of strength or I don't have the clarity in mind to be focused. Therefore, I have to, t- I have to take the nap. I have to go to sleep. I have to eat, whatever it may be. So that's the case. It's not, I've done enough for today. I fulfilled my quota of studying for an hour. You fill your quota, that means you, you, you complete, you feel that's enough, okay, now you're susceptible. Now you're susceptible to the machinations and all the approaches and attacks of the evil inclination. We'll get back to this. You know, this parsha, this portion, we find multiple, multiple mitzvahs, one following the other. The Torah says if you come upon a mother bird nesting on its chicks or on its eggs, the Torah says there's a positive commandment, you must send away the mother bird, and only then are you permitted to take the chicks or the eggs, and if you don't, if you take the chicks and the eggs together with the mother bird or you don't send her off, it's a negative commandment. You should not take the mother together with the children. Negative commandment. And if you do send off the mother bird, you merit longevity. Then the, the Torah continues. If a person built a house you must put a mat on its roof. You must put a parapet on the roof. So there should not be blood shed in your home. Because if you have no parapet, a fence on the roof, a person could fall off the roof to his dead, to his death. And then it says, if you purchase a field, you're not permitted to cross breed crops. Then the Torah says, you're not permitted to work, to plow a field with a donkey, an ox and a donkey. And one after another. Then the Torah says, if you buy, have a four, you buy a four-cornered garment, you must put fringes on the four corners. One after another. So the Midrash says, first it starts with Ben Sura Mora. The person who's the defiant son, the rebellious son, he goes and steals, and he's a glutton. The parents rain in on him. He's still defiant. 
Ultimately, what happens? The parents don't take him to court to put him to death. He becomes a highwayman and he commits murder. So he's put to death. So from what do we see from there? We see from there that Avero Guerrero's Avero. The one sin leads to another. It goes from bad to worse. As we say, it's a slippery slope. You start at one level and one engenders and brings the other. So the Midrash says, we learn, Shavero Gores Avero, Umit. This is Pirkei Avos also. One mitzvah engenders. I mean, we see in the Torah, one mitzvah engenders another. Dirsiv, he kore kansipo lefonecho. If you come upon the nest of a bird, Shalech de Shalach. Send off the mother bird. It will be good for you. You'll have longevity of days. What does it say immediately afterwards? You will build a new house. You make a, put a parapet on the roof. Meaning if you send off the mother bird. You'll merit to build a new house. To put a parapet on the roof. What does it say after that? You can't crossbreed crops. You will merit a vineyard and a field to plant. You should not plow with an ox and donkey together, hitch together. You should not wear a combination of wool and linen. You merit quality garments, made of wool, quality garments made of linen. You put tzitzis, you put fringes on that. Man marries a woman. So what do we find from the continuous juxtaposition one after another? One mitzvah engenders another mitzvah. One sin engenders another sin. Therefore, the Torah juxtaposes all these various portions one to the other to extrapolate this principle. You see something phenomenal. The Gemara tells us based on Moshe Rabbeinu said to Kalal Yisrael, what am I asking of you? Kim God is asking you should fear him. That's all he's asking you. So Mar says, what does it mean? Everything else in life is predestined. Distance. Choice. That's all it is. Mashem, show, show me what. Lioroso. That's it, to fear him. So what's the inference of that? Outside of fear, God says, I provide everything. All I want you to do is what? To make the right choice. Based on your reverence, on your fear of God, how to invest and where to make the enterprise. Do you take it in one direction or you take it in another direction? That's what God wants. Now, we find that the Medjus tells us what was the blueprint for existence? The blueprint for existence was the Torah itself. In the words of the Midrash, the Midrash says, it's an Aramaic, Istakl Baraisu Bari Alma. God looked into the Torah and he created the world. Now, the law is Fitfilin or Mezuzah or Sefer Torah, the leather or the parchment could only come from a kosher species. If it's not a kosher species, the parchment and the hide doesn't qualify. So why does a kosher species have a hide? You know why? Because there's a mitzvah tefillin. So God, so what's the blueprint why the kosher species have a hide? Because the Torah says since there's this tefillin, so tefillin and tefillin can only be made from a kosher species, so therefore a kosher species has, has to have a hide because it wouldn't have a hide, <laughs> you wouldn't be able to have tefillin. Why do kosher species of fish have skins and fa- skins and scales? Why? 
Do you know why? Because God says there's a law of dietary laws, and the only kosher species, that's how you identify a kosher species, if it has fins and scales. So therefore, a kosher species has to have that. So this is the blueprint. Whatever exists within existence is only because that's to accommodate. We need these contexts to be able to be the context for the fulfillment of the Torah itself. That's the reason. So this is the concept of Istako Borais and Borei Alma. Okay? Every Jew has an obligation to, if you have a house, to build a makeh. Now, we have a principle of mitzvah goras mitzvah, as we said. So normally when we think about mitzvah goras mitzvah, you know, you give charity, what happens? You're walking down the street, you find a lost article. You did one mitzvah, Hashem presents you with an opportun- another opportunity. You just took 10% of your income and gave it to a poor man, all of a sudden now you find a lost article, now you gotta be busy returning a lost article. You return a lost article, now the personal loss he claims that you stole 50% of what you're returning to. <laughs> right? I'm saying this facetiously. But I'm saying that's that's with the mitzvah goreh mitzvah. One mitzvah engenders another one. But it's much more than that. You send away the mother bird. Torah says, I will give you the opportunity to put a parapet on the roof. The man says, I don't have two people. I, the bank mortgage. How am I supposed to build a new house? Hashem says, I will provide the means that you'll be able to build a new house. So mitzvah, mitzvah is not only the mitzvah opportunity, God will create, give you the context, the means, the material to be able to fulfill the mitzvah. He will give you the means to build a new house to put that parapet on the roof. After you put the parapet on the roof. Now that mitzvah you've done engenders another mitzvah. What is that? You're not permitted to plant wheat or a grain near a vineyard. I, I can't afford a vineyard and I can't afford a field. And I can't even afford the seed to plant the field. Hashem will give you the means to purchase the vineyard and the field. You and you observe the negative commandment. God says, now you're going to have an opportunity not to plow with an ox and a donkey sh- hitched together in the field. The person says, I have no oxen, I have no, no donkeys. I don't own two species of animals. He'll give you the means. So not only is Hashem giving you the opportunity to do the mitzvah in the mitzvah itself, He provides the context, the means to be able to do the mitzvah. This is, this is the concept of mitzvah goris mitzvah. Now, how do you understand it? Very simple. The Gemara tells us in two locations. One's financial allocation is determined on Rosh Hashanah, how much you're receiving for the, for the, for the total year till next Rosh Hashanah. One's financial allocation. Now, what's included in that allocation? So, your needs are, now, who's determining your needs? So, let's say I did the mitzvah of Shalom Khan, I sent away the mother bird. Torah says, this man has to build a house because he has to do the mitzvah of God says in that allocation is included money to be able to afford a house or to put down a down payment to get the mortgage from the bank. Or your financial standing will be sufficient to get that. That's how Kobe Deshamayim. Liyira, just to fear me. Everything is allocated. He's the provider. The only th- Our input is only what? What direction do we go? Do we go to the right? Do we go to the left? That's free. Outside of that, God is the full provider. And he provides. So that is a goreh mitzvah. What means that? That's you. If you've made the choice to do the mitzvah, to send the mother, not to them together. What have you made? You've made the right choice. You've made a choice that activates a system called mitzvah goreh mitzvah. So if that's the case, okay. Now your allocation becomes a different allocation. And one encourages the other, engenders the other. And it's, it's non-stopping. That's what it is. The Chavetz Chaim cites a posuk that reward Hashem gives us for mitzvahs is chesed. How's it chesed? Right? We're called, the Gemara calls uh, a human being, we're daily employees. We're employees. 
his employees, he permitted, he's getting, getting paid, and what, he takes off time from the employer's time to do his own thing, right? That's called embezzlement. How do you have a right? The time is the employees. So we're, we're God's employees. So, so that they paid, we paid a wage, right? So, so why, is, why is it chesed? But it is chesed. He, gives, he explains it with an with a allegory. This person, he, um, he apprentices to be a diamond cutter by one of the best teachers, masters in, in the industry. And this master sees this, this young man has tremendous potential to be also one of the best. If he's trained and he's given the right type of tutelage, he'll be the best diamond cutter, one of the best. So he has an agreement with the parents. He's going to take this young man under his supervision and he will provide for five years room, board, clothing, the equipment, and the rough for him to practice. And he will train. Okay? When he started with this master, he had a small amount of rough. And he would sell the diamonds that he would cut himself and that he would train his student, his apprentice to cut after five years his business expands and he's not able to cut all the rough that he has and he has to give it out to other cutters meantime this young man developed to be the best in the industry, nobody cuts diamonds the way he cuts and he pays him a pittance compared to what he's paying others to cut the diamonds so the young man comes to the to his employer, to his teacher and he says to him, it seems to be not fair. Everybody else, you're paying them 20, 30 times what you're paying me. And here, I cut the diamond better than they cut it. I don't think it's fair. So the master says to him, he says, I'm going to explain it to you. These people, I never invested a penny in them. Never gave them food, never gave them clothing, never trained them. And when they cut the rough, it's on their own equipment. I have nothing to do with them. They delivered me with a finished product where I have no investment in the cost of having that finished diamond. You, every aspect of your being, your clothing, your food, your knowledge, your ability, the equipment, it's all mine. I provide it all. Therefore, you only deserve a small amount. You don't deserve more than that. So the Chavetz Chaim says, if I call me chutz that we exist, we lift our hand to do a mitzvah. That way our, our minds work that we have an intelligence, we have retention, we have focus, we have ability, creativity. That's all a divine endowment. God what to do. Just turn that little lever slightly to the right or to the left. That's what I'm asking you. And what happens? You move a mountain which is three tons of earth by moving making a slight movement. Do you think you want to be paid like a hauler who's been busy with us for six months, hauling this, the, all this, this, this earth? Hashem says you get full credit. I give you full credit. That's not chesed. That's not chesed. In terms of investment, the return, God's giving it to us for nothing. It's like a parent says, you know, you work for me, I'll pay you dollars an hour. The boy's not worth more than five cents. So, but factually, to train him, encourage him, the love that he has to him, he wants to give them that. The same idea. It's impossible to succeed unless God builds our existence. All God wants is Yerushalayim. I always say, what is it analogous to? A person is in a boat on a raging river. The current is overwhelmingly strong and you have a rudder in the back of that boat. And to direct the boat, whether it goes over the falls or goes in the right direction, we're not going over the falls, you just have to turn that rudder. Why is the boat moving? Because you're turning the rudder. It's moving is because of the current. Of course, the water is surging. That's why it's moving. You have to just turn it slightly in either direction, whether it goes over the falls or it goes in the right direction where you're going to a, a location which is safe. That's what life is all about. Hakobi de Shemaim. God provides it all. All I'm asking you, you're Shemaim. You come upon a mother bird. Do you send away the bird? Don't you send away the bird. Okay? 
Send away the bird, you've turned it in the right direction. You know what you merit? A make, a parapet. But where's the house? The check's coming in the mail. You'll be able to build the house. And th that's what life's all about. And if a person truly reads life well, you speak to people who survived the war, the concentration camps. Everyone, if they really took a recording of their survival, there were endless miracles that happened. They could have died a thousand times, whether it was disease, whether it was under because of the Nazi Yemach Shema, whatever it was, or other anti-Semitism, or escape, or whatever it was. Maybe to would say, you know, something. I wish I would have died because of whatever else. It's irrelevant. But factually, Hashem was with them. Things happened out of the ordinary, almost miraculously, and only because of that they were able to survive. Otherwise, they shouldn't have survived. The pain must be maybe also overwhelming. It upset whatever that may be. But it's clear, clearly, do you see the hand of God? No question, you see the hand of God. And that's, and that's it. How could be what do you do to even to deserve that miracle? You don't know what. You have no idea why. Do you know what's down the pike? What God has in store for us? What God wants us to do? Nobody knows. It's interesting, you know, today, you know, as time goes on and we have all the ad ad advancements in medicine, people live longer. There's longevity. People live another 10 years, 20 years, 30 years compared to going back 50 years ago. So you say, but you know, life is quality of life. Quality of life. How does a people, person preoccupied? He's going to doctors day and night. He has an aid. He's taking medications. He's busy on the phone with the pharmacy. Tell you. Understand. For a Jew, it's not dependent on your action, on your activity necessarily. If a Jew believes in God, a Jew has Avas Hashem. He loves God. A Jew says the Shema. A Jew puts on tefillin. A Jew has a mezuzah on his doorpost. A Jew wears tzitzis. Every moment, the Gemara says, mitzvah You should be careful even with a, a slight mitzvah as a severe mitzvah. Ki mitzvah. We, you don't even know what the reward for a mitzvah is. So what's the value of a mitzvah from one moment? And the mission tells us, that there's not enough reward in this existence to live a thousand years that God could reward you. In this, in this existence. So what's the value of living an extra day, an extra year, another 30 years? But I'm incapacitated. It's irrelevant if you're incapacitated. But within that context, unless the person is in a coma, chas v'sholem, right? But even in a coma, we say yusur mimarkim. Suffering is an atonement. That's a cleansing. So even when a person is in pain, the Gemara says in... Uh, in one location, Chulin, when a person stubs his finger, his toe, and you see stars and you have pain, at that moment they pronounce from above that you should stub your toe. Because they pronounced it. You needed that, that pain for that moment because some correction has to be. Everything is value. We speak about Kapora. Everything is an atonement. And that's what it is. So every opportunity, pain, person lives longer, the person's writhing from arthritis pain, doesn't make a difference. But if you take it within the context and say, it's a person has to take a pill, God forbid has to take chemo. Pain is suffering, is, 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 is overwhelming, but guaranteed he will have a recovery and he's gonna live another 50 years. Is the person willing to endure the pain? And it's definitely, but it's pain, it's irrelevant. What's the pain doing? It's extending your life. People will undergo that pain if it extends life even for one year, six months. People undergo it. So what's pain in life? Nothing happens. Nothing is what is arbitrary. Everything is, is selected and specific. It has value. You just have to have the right mindset. Do you reject God? Do you become upset with God? Or do you embrace and say, Gamzul Tova, how do you take it? Everything is based on the process, how we process life. That's what it is. You know, the Ramban, Nachmanides writes, Torah Sa'odom, which he speaks about the world to come, about what suffering is, what Gehenim is, spiritual, spiritual atonement, suffering. 
He says, one moment of Gehenim, bases it on verses and Kabbalah, one moment of Gehenim, one moment, a moment, we're talking about a nanosecond, less than that, is more than all the travails of Eo, of Job, combined. Every moment. A person needs that to what? To be cleansed, to be able to go to the world to come. Okay? So I have a question. In this world, we say a person suffers, has any type of financial setback. The Gemara says if you put your hand in your pocket and you want to take out one coin and you take out the wrong coin, that's considered suffering. So it's, it's an inconvenience. At a certain level, that's considered that the moment. So in this world, suffering is almost nothing compared to what it is there. So why, when you hear, you only have to suffer relatively slightly and you're fully atoned and when you pass from this world, the suffering has to be, every moment is more than the travails and the suffering of Job. So the way, I think the way we have to understand it is because when you suffer in this world and you take it well, in this world, as long as we're alive, we still have choice. You could take it well and say, Baruch Hashem, Hashem gave me an, atone, an opportunity to atone, or you could bolt from God and say, God forbid, and become a heretic. So because it's within kind of choice, that's why even lesser suffering has the value of greater suffering. Once a person didn't take advantage of this life, and you go there already, it's, it's beyond choice. You have no longer have choice. Once you don't have choice, now we have to deal with the problem. Making the right choice is the major part of the atonement that you chose to take this as atonement. You know, you choose to take a pill. If you don't choose to take the pill out of the bottle and put it in your mouth, it's, you're not going to be healed from the medication. So what is it? It's the choice. It's taking the initiative. In this world, we're always in an initiative state. Initiatives. Yes, no, right, wrong. Once a person, God forbid, passes on, there's no longer initiatives. Now you're just in a predicament of rehabilitation. Then the rehabilitation has to really be severe and very serious, and that's even more serious than the suffering of Job to be continued.